conversation that started a long time ago and will continue to happen. So I encourage you to continue to participate through social media, but also through the activist spaces that you're already engaged in, um, because this is but one part of that, of that bigger picture. Um, so we'll start with, uh, with um, inviting the DSG to deliver some opening remarks, but after that we'll have two of our panelists open the conversation by talking about climate financing. Um, so we're going straight in and dealing with some of the biggest topics first, um, but then this will move straight into a conversation around adaptation and resilience um, with two other panelists. And finally, we will hear a few words uh, from our fifth member, uh, but this will be specifically around intersectionality as well as highlighting some of the work of the, of the youth advisory group over the last year and a bit. So without further ado, I would now like to invite the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed to deliver her opening remarks. Great. Thank you so much, Ernest. And I, I hope that you uh, can all hear me. Um, greetings to everyone joining this virtual dialogue today. What an amazing panel. Thank you, Jayatma. You continue to disrupt as the SG said you should when you first took on this uh, job. Um, pleased to be with you all and, and really to engage in a conversation on a vital topic, climate change. And I've just come out of um, the uh, economies, the major economies forum where the US uh, chaired um, uh, discussions with leaders. And I can tell you that um, while those discussions are very welcome, we are far from the ambition that's needed to get to COP. So a lot of work to do. Um, and this, as the world is facing climate, social, health, and economic crises, conflicts, and rising inequalities. Climate disruption has been a climate amplifier and a multiplier as we see every day. The Secretary General has said that the latest intergovernmental panel um, report on climate change is a code red for humanity. Our decisions today are, today are going to determine whether our responses to these challenges um, leads to a breakdown of global solidarity and cooperation or do we get a breakthrough to a greener, more sustainable, equal world? Um, young people, you know this, um, and, and this is what you have been advocating for, uh, demonstrating um, in all the work that you do, participating in trying to make that change happen now. Uh, so your voices, holding decision makers accountable, um, employing innovative solutions that I've seen more recently in the Food Systems Summit process, and mobilizing communities to accelerate the urgent action that's needed for a breakthrough. Governments will have to listen to young people's demands and step up with tangible solutions to address the current and the future crises, uh, supporting our green, blue, and inclusive uh, recoveries. The last six months have provided a glimpse into the catastrophic potential of climate disruption. Uh, storms, floods, drought-induced famine, raging wildfires and heat waves causing tremendous suffering to people worldwide. And no one is exempt. Hurricane Ida here in New York caused devastating uh, loss of life and widespread disruption. And the most affected communities are also the most vulnerable and marginalized in any country. So the issue of inequality very high on everyone's agenda. Our window of opportunity to fight the climate crisis is rapidly closing. And that's why the Secretary General has called for three major priorities leading to COP26. First, we are going to have to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial averages. The UNFCCC is publishing its report today on the nationally determined contributions currently on the table. And the news is not good. The latest data implies an increase of 16% in emissions in 2030 compared to the 2010 levels, which is a pathway to a temperature increase of 2.7 degrees. So we are well away from the promises made in Paris. Second, we must ensure that developed countries meet their financial commitments. And that is why investing 100 billion per year in developing countries and ensuring that countries in need can access resources to protect their people against the impact of climate change is, is key. The OECD report just released again today on where we stand, we still have a gap of about 20 billion. And let's make it clear, the 100 billion is a handshake of the world's commitment to financing these transitions so we can get to the 1.5 degree world. It is not the money that is needed for climate action, that runs into the trillions. Third, we need a breakthrough on adaptation and resilience, ensuring that at least 50% of all climate finance is directed to it. 
While some donors have honored this commitment, overall, we are falling short with just 20% of global finance currently directed to adaptation solutions. So while we are commending countries such as Denmark, the Netherlands and Sweden for their leadership and, and, and their increase, I believe Netherlands of 70% of their funding to adaptation, we still need to see the multilateral development banks step up significantly. It's time for us to raise our voices even further and to join forces to accelerate action. So today I'm really happy to co-host this timely conversation with youth uh, experts and those with lived experiences on climate finance, adaptation, resilience, as we push for an ambitious journey towards COP, uh, leaving no one behind, is the promise of the 2030 agenda and is absolutely applicable to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the UN, as always, stands ready to work with young people to drive climate action and implement the SDGs by 2030. So I very much look forward to this discussion, your reflections, recommendations, and as Jayas must say, even the frustrations. Um, this will put more fire um, under our feet um, uh, to get us rolling up our sleeves and, and doing the work that we need to do urgently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anina. What a wonderful start. Um, and, I, and I have to say, I'm so excited because it's so refreshing to hear a leader talk about the musts and the wills and the, and the have tos, as opposed to the we should and we could and we might. Um, so I'm, 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 really, I'm really loving the, the strength of the language that you're using around ensuring that we're calling out bad behavior, but more importantly, that we're supporting solutions. Um, and what a, what a better way to start um, this conversation. So I would now like to invite uh, Millie and uh, Julius to the virtual podium um, to, to really begin this conversation and we'll start with climate financing. Um, uh, so maybe if I could start with you, uh, Millicent, um, paint a picture for us uh, around what it's like to access climate financing at a national, at a subnational level, um, and, and really understanding how it is that we can influence some of the direction of climate financing at a national level. Um, and what are, some of the, what are some of the issues? But more importantly, thinking about some of the solutions. How do we ensure that we can change that system that may not be working for us? Over to you, Melissa. Taget of us, Ernest, moderator, and Olketa for this opportunity to share. Um, Your Excellency, um, I join everyone in thanking you for your time and presence. Uh, to be here with us today, it speaks volumes of the UN's ongoing commitment to ensure uh, that the climate conversation is inclusive. Uh, thank you. Um, so I work a lot with traditional knowledge, uh, which means I hang out a lot with elders in our communities. Um, years ago, an elder instilled this wisdom, which I've kept throughout my social entrepreneurship journey. Um, if I may translate, uh, money makes the world go round, but love is its sunlight. The interdependence of these two, through, two throats as one is undeniable. Climate finance is fundamental to keeping our world going, but what is it worth when those who truly need it find great challenges to access it? For us in the Pacific Islands region, love has deep roots to our land and ocean. We constitute the smallest of the Earth's space and population, and we call home in the biggest and deepest of the world's oceans. When it comes to climate change, our contribution to emissions is the smallest, yet we are affected by it in the biggest and deepest way. I come from a small village, Lilisiana in the Solomon Islands, where 30 years of my existence, we have lost 20 meters of our land. Our only fresh water source is now salty. Our land is no longer fertile for root crops to feed our people. And king tides and cyclones have doubled their visitations, affecting our livelihoods. My people carry the weight of uncertainty on their shoulders daily, but are still so resilient to keep moving forward. Elders and experts predict that by the time I am 45, I will no longer have Lilisiana to call home. 
My story is no different to every other Pacific Islander you may, you may meet. Some, their homes have completely submerged underwater. In some, in some, their ecosystems, watersheds, food and oxygen sources destroyed, even in the name of carbon trading. Our losses caused by climate change are permanent. Our changes are irreversible. And this is why cl climate finance is critical. The climate emergency requires collaborative efforts from all sectors and funding is an integral part of this contribution. There is a discord in discourse with both the private and public sectors. Most of the funding will come from foreign bodies whose underlying interests are often economic. Projects are usually duplicated and involve top-down approaches where vulnerable communities miss out on. Ultimately, the funding would go to mitigation and, and adaptation. But over time, how long would funding last? And how does a community become self-reliant? For us, capacity building must be core to climate investments and through segmentation, meaning it has to be through the influential public teacher of a community a leader training the youth to carry on the work and reinforced in homes, churches, and social circles. A project is never sustainable when sustainability is a foreign idea delivered by foreign people through foreign communications. Thus, the need to build capacity is paramount and cannot happen without adequate backing, which at present, as small island nations, we can only rely on international sources of climate finance because of the economic downturn we are facing. Your Excellency, here's my call to you. At present, there is no link between the public and private sectors when it comes to climate change. This must be a unified fight. I wish to see more public-private partnerships explored and sustained in this fight for climate justice. We must enable small islands and developing countries to have more access to international funding so that the funds can reach the local communities. That way, smaller groups and associations can, independently of government or developed countries' support, they can participate in becoming more, more climate resilient, building on their capacity and driving from their expertise and traditional knowledge. Hemnoma from me, thank you, Thomas, again. Thank you, Thomas, Millicent. Um, it, it's really, really a, a nice thing to hear um, the stories of the ways in which intergenerational conversation still lives on so strongly across Pacific Island countries. Uh, and I, I really thank you and applaud you for sharing your story. And a really awesome takeaway from you is that we need to start thinking about climate financing as investments in people, as investments in communities, and ensuring that these investments, in the same way that we've invested in, in stocks for, for decades, um, are taken care of and are nurtured um, and have a, an enormous sense of longevity. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you, Tomas, for, for sharing your story. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Julius because I know you, you do a lot of work um, uh, in, the, in the global space and I'd like to really understand what climate financing at, at a global level looks like um, and perhaps what are some of the ways we can start to see that it, it filters down a lot more evenly uh, to communities. So over to you, Julius. Thank you so much, Ernest. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you for this opportunity. It's quite fulfilling to actually just uh, sit with my colleagues and, and have a discussion on, on climate finance and fully need some youth perspective. As we all of us need to appreciate, uh, finance is not just an enabler for climate action, but a lifeline for vulnerable nations and communities on the front line of climate change. And as such, then finance is a justice issue. The challenge at hand, as we all of us know, is immense. We need to raise adaptive capacity and keep within 1.5 degree guardrail. And to do that, 
we have to appreciate finance within another kind of thinking, with a new thinking. We need to deliver quality finance as a global community, particularly countries that are major uh, contributors and are required according to the convention, but also the Paris Agreement to provide financing uh, to vulnerable nations. And the quality finance then would mean that we're not just looking at the amounts of money or rather finance that should be provided, but we should also look at the kinds of more financial modalities that are actually being used uh, to deliver financing to vulnerable nations and local communities. I would give an example for uh, it would be really defeating to provide adaptation finance uh, as loans for countries whose level of financial and economic capability is actually lying on the on an edge and that would add additional burden and stress to such countries. Predictability also becomes another important question if you're thinking about finance within the local community or rather the national context, because then we need to do planning, we need to plan for the projected climate change impacts, we need to plan for onset, slow and onset climate events and loss and damage thinking about it. And as such, we need to have a predictable finance placed on the table through commitments that we can project into the future. And we can also talk about the adequacy of finance, where we think about um, how much exactly do we want to scale up in view of the needs of developing countries and vulnerable nations. Then we have to then appreciate again as, as a global community that all these facets are within and at the heart of the Convention of the Paris Agreement. But importantly, the foundational pillar of all this is accountability and transparency. So we need to definitely think about how do we want to move forward thinking of solutions around being able to put everything on the table clearly and in transparent terms. Well, we appreciate that the 100 billion goal is one of the key targets and, and everybody and particularly developed nations want to really bridge the gap in financing towards the 100 billion goal. We have to appreciate, as mentioned by the DSG, that the 100 billion goal is a political compromise, was a political compromise in Copenhagen and does not actually reflect the actual needs of developing nations. And as such, much needs to be done. If you think about the solutions, therefore, we would need and we need to repurpose the financial architecture to make sure that it serves the climate needs of the vulnerable nations, marginalized groups, in particular youth, women, and indigenous peoples. A mechanism that is really purposeful enough to drive prosperity must have strong inbuilt, and I mean strong inbuilt accountability and, and transparency checks that would actually rekindle and strengthen trust building in the community of nations. And importantly, it should be within the circles of exactly who honors their pledges, are the pledges scaled up, because then these are the things that translate at the end of the day at the community level as the safeguard for livelihoods and for lives. We need to think about at the same time that scaling finance and provision of such must make sure that indeed those efforts are entirely with the needs of vulnerable nations. The Standing Committee on Finance will be releasing a determination of needs report. And as we think about finance within COP26, then we are looking at financial pledges that should definitely tally with those needs. And even moving forward into the post-2025 uh, climate finance ambition and goal, that should be the center, the mantra that we want to carry. I think we need to change, uh, we need a change of heart to say, and we need decisive action, particularly when you want to bridge the gap of the ever growing adaptation and mitigation finance imbalance. And as it has been mentioned, 80% goes to mitigation, 20% goes to adaptation. And just to rub the thoughts to the wound, because this is so interesting, it's quite unfortunate that adaptation finance is sadly and largely provided as loans with little grants being provided. And, and this is always not helpful. As a matter of fact, this is a justice issue again. So we would want life communities on the front line of climate justice actually be able to access finance in grant terms for adaptation so that we don't build in that stress within these countries. I would say again that it would be important for us to read from the same script. We have different understanding of what counts to new a new one addition. We have different understanding of climate finance. That's why when we do the checks and balances during the accounting, it's separate and different from different uh, parts on and parties. And as such, I would call and we would urge for clear understanding of what exactly finance terms are. Just to conclude, I think 
important and very important to have a new thinking where we want to have young people and young people modeling financial facilities and having them model together with partners practical ways of accessing finance for them to actually implement uh, climate change programs, uh, which would ensure that our I think we might be experiencing a, a bit of a technical difficulty, um, but I think there were so many gems um, really that Julius has been able to mention in that very short period of time, looking at ensuring that our, our accountability mechanisms are, uh, are strengthened, that they actually exist within the system, but also that we're ensuring that we're holding a level of 360 accountability on both ends. Um, and ensuring that we're building capacity at, at national and recipient level to ensure that countries are in a position to receive climate financing in its current form. Um, um, and I think, yeah, uh, really an amazing, uh, an, amazing, an, an amazing set of examples. And, and I think one really clear takeaway is that we need to start singing from the same hymn book. Um, we have a real issue if, if everybody's doing their own thing and reinterpreting climate financing um, as and when it pleases them. Uh, because it means that, uh, unfortunately, there's no standardization of, of this. Um, but I'm going to hand over, I, I think you have the unenviable task, uh, Deputy Secretary General, of, of having to react to, to two pretty amazing presentations. Um, but I, I'm, I'm nevertheless going to hand over to you, uh, Amina, uh, for, your, for your intervention. Thank you so much, Ernest. They say sometimes be careful what you ask for when you're having a robust interaction with youth, you just might get it. And I think um, both uh, Millicent and, and, um, and, and Julius have, have brought onto the table some crucial issues. Fortunately, we are dealing with them, but you know, somehow for me, uh, the response is where uh, we need to find ways of um, landing this differently, because I have to tell you, um, it's not that the stories that we hear from Millicent have not been told before. I look back at the number of, of GAs and the number of COPs where we have had a young person um, from the SIDS to come and tell us exactly what is happening and we're going under and you're sitting here thinking that you can take a couple more years of negotiating. Crossing T's and dotting I's is putting us underwater. So it, it's not had the effect that we thought it would have if you know people really had the hearts and minds to deliver on climate action. We thought Paris was a breakthrough um, six years later I'm not so sure that that breakthrough isn't about promises being broken. And um, we have to you know, somehow find ways of, of um, bringing attention uh, to leaders that they cannot continue to do this because it has implications um, in people's lives and certainly the future of the planet. So uh, somehow words and, and um, statements are not landing. Um, and when they do, uh, they don't land um, urgently um, or sufficiently in scale. They, they land in very small programs and projects which are not making the difference we need to get ahead um, um, of what is happening in terms of climate and meeting the 1.5 degrees. Let me say that um, it's, it's um, when we talked, you talked about the, uh, the whole financial architecture um, is not right for the demands that we have today. And the, the SG has been trying, Secretary General has been trying to bring the world together um, in the G20, in other nations, uh, in, is focusing on the G7, uh, to say that, look, we need to look at this differently. Um, we cannot, on the one hand, as we uh, respond to COVID, for instance, um, we cannot, on the one hand, talk about some of, the, um, some, some, of the, some of the initiatives that have been taken on debt, only to find that when you are using that debt relief in order to get some fiscal space, um, and you do have the capacity and the track to go and borrow and you get to the market and then you find that credit rating agencies have put you down and so it's even more difficult to get it. Or that in, 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 in developing countries, you are accessing credit at 1% and you're coming to Africa, for instance, and it's 8 or 9%. So the inequalities um, in uh, the, the financial system itself um, are huge and this is something we need to tackle. These are much more structural. Um, and uh, they required a level of political commitment, which um, for you um, in the journey ahead in this intergenerational transition, the geopolitics are very real. Um, and I, you know, this applies to everything. Um, and so I see 
uh, particularly when we want to speak about that, we, we, we speak perhaps to two of our, our bigger nations where the emissions are clearly something we have to grapple with. One coming earlier with reducing peaking and, and, and uh, uh, getting to 2030, 2050 uh, net zero, um, doing more because they have more and have benefited um, at the expense of others on it. Uh, but others that are growing and growing in a way that needs to be green and not brown, and, and they do need to peak earlier. And, and so when you, when you speak to our two great powers, um, there is a disconnect in, um, in really the effect that they're having um, in, uh, you know, around the world. And that needs to be brought together. Where's the leverage for that? Um, and I've really been sort of thinking about this uh, day in, day out. Um, where, where do we find it? We, we've used um, the small island developing states to make the argument. Obviously, we're not making headway. So could we bring the urgency and vulnerability of um, small island states together um, with the vulnerability, the population and the economic potential economic power of Africa um, to see how, like we'd see in the ACP, we can bring more leverage and more voice and more leaning in um, to, to, uh, to try to get nations to, to change their trajectories, which are affecting essentially um, billions of people. Um, I, I find the discussion when it comes to small island states, it's always at the very end, it's almost as though we're ticking a box for our um, you know, moral duty. This is not just a moral duty. This is really about humanity um, and uh, their rights to exist um, on an earth that is for all of us and not just for a few. So I think you know, these arguments need to continue to be made in a way um, that shows the implications and the how interconnected that we are and that the transitions that must happen must be just. And so it's true, there are many developing countries that need to go through just transitions and exit from fossil fuels. Um, but there is a greater sense now that if that is to happen, financing needs to be on the table. And I think as both our, our panelists uh, spoke to, it needs to be financing that is accessible. So some countries, the investment in our here and now for the future um, is not about a handout. It's, it is an investment and so therefore accessibility to grants and, and such like for more vulnerable countries is essential. But so is also if you want to take loans, which is another investment, we ought to be able to negotiate um, the, the parameters for that so that it becomes um, uh, feedback. So, I, I mean, finance must also go beyond just the, the, the money that's needed. It has to be the means of implementation. And over all of that, I think the greatest currency that is missing on the table here is trust. Um, and this is fast eroding any of the negotiations that we're having or the belief of young people in institutions and what they can do for them, even if they're elected into office. So we have a trust deficit that needs to be filled. The means of implementation needs to talk about that because it is technology, it is finance, um, and, and we need, and it is capacity. I heard you talking about capacity building and capacity building at a scale um, that, that you're not ending up with a population that the, the capacity building is so small that the people who have that capacity building are then pulled back into the international community and you lose it in the nation. Um, so it flees, it, it's, it's capacity building to flee uh, rather than sufficiently that some can go out and be beneficial in the diaspora and others can stay home to try to do this. So we need to get that argument right. Public private sector, um, you know, again, explored, sustained. Uh, the food system summit process that we, we spoke about now, real um, tensions in, in, uh, in, in the uh, constituencies, civil society, youth and the private sector. Um, but you know, the private sector is, has shareholders and those shareholders are the ones we probably need to target, not the chief executives, because the shareholders can make demands that chief executives have to listen to and not necessarily uh, you know, placards outside their office. So finding strategically, where are those constituencies that we need to tackle and to change um, what the discourse at the table uh, when that happens? And perhaps as coalitions, can you also become shareholders? Can you bring your voice and become shareholders in some of these big conglomerates that um, one needs to tackle? Um, and maybe finally to, to, to speak to um, the, uh, uh, the point around, you know, what we do this for. We, we're, we're talking about a vision of your future um, and whatever we do now will affect that, uh, whether it is yours or it is future generations. The common ground needs to be very basic needs that we have to be, um, we have to have access to finance for. And that, that is about basic services, but it is also about disaster risk, 
um, uh, mitigation in everything that we do, we need to look at adaptation in a very serious way. Um, but it must be in the context of the vision of countries that is not the same. We cannot, you know, apply for, um, you know, the Solomon Islands, a vision of even my country, Nigeria, or, you know, a country in Europe. It, it's not the same. And we should not be said to be um, progressing and developing into something that obviously has not been sustainable when it comes to climate and the way consumption um, and production happen. So we have something to teach people about the value of life, which is about your needs and not necessarily your wants, because those wants take you off the chart, as we have seen um, as the markets have driven that and have driven um, what, what we've seen in consumption. So I think a much more uh, robust discussion um, about the visions, the different visions, the diversity um, in the number of visions that you see and how that is all something that we can finance. So it's not out of reach. Um, and and um, it is, we have no problem with profit. Uh, we only come up against it when it starts to be off the back of people and damage and harmful um, and does harm. That's where we draw the line. Profit's fine. Do it with people at the center, not on their backs um, and not doing damage uh, to the planet. So this, this discussion for me, lots more advocacy that you have to do. The COP26 pre-COP in Milan is really important to bring your messages with clarity. Um, don't get them lost in the noise. Don't be distracted by, I must take everything into the room. Find what the arrowhead is um, in arguing the finance space um, on mitigation, on the 100 billion, on adapting on ad adaptation and what that means for you and start targeting some of the leaders that can make that decision and the MDBs that can do it. In Africa, the African Development Bank should be doing 50% of its lending there. What is the World Bank doing? These are all institutions that have representation of government, which represents us, the people. So I think it's important that you're very targeted at uh, pre-COP in Milan. Um, COP26 um, is one of those really important milestones, a, a pivotal one in, in the journey that we have to 2030 and 2050. But always look ahead. You have to be looking ahead to get a, 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 a breast of the curve. 2020, uh, 2022 is an amazing year because it's a year in which the G20 will be led by Indonesia. It is a year in which the COP27 will be in Africa. How do we profit from that? Because these are two countries, one growing really fast and maybe not so green. Um, and, and then seeing Africa that could go green or could go brown, but a massive population and the muscle to say, okay, as Africa re, uh, leads the ACP, what can we do with that momentum? How can you start to plan beyond COP? Um, we need COP because without it, we have a very weak stepping stone into COP27. So we must deliver COP26, but start thinking about COP27 right now and the demands that we'll be making to, to, to land um, finances um, in, in, in implementing the agendas that we have in front of us. Thank you very much, Amina. Um, and I think what I'm hearing is that we have some fundamental and systemic issues that we need to challenge. And really the way we do that is by changing the game, ensuring that we can really reinvent this, this game and change the rules and make them work for us and make them work for the planet and make them work for people. My mother used to say uh, all the time, and I'm pretty sure she's, she's completely stolen this from a movie, but that there's a head and there's a neck. And you always go for the neck because the neck is what turns the head. And so that's what we're talking about when it comes to shareholding. We're looking for the people that can make the head look in a different direction. I think this is a fantastic segue into, into our next session. So big Vinakavakalevu, Tangi Tumas, to Millicent and Julius for, for joining us for this first part. And then I'm happy to now invite Archana and Sophia to the floor, to the virtual podium, if you would. Um, uh, and to really kickstart the discussion around adaptation um, and resilience. Uh, and I think we've had a great conversation around climate financing and ensuring that financing is available and accessible to communities, but also that it's a reflecting of the reality that we're in now. Uh, the fact of the matter is we've reached a point where we need to be adapting. We need to be adapting to the situation that we currently have. Uh, mitigation is no longer the only answer. Um, so, uh, please, I'd love to welcome Sophia and Archana. Perhaps we'll, we'll start with you, Sophia, if that's okay. 
Um, and really, I'd love to hear from you a little bit around how when you're a climate activist in a, in a space where it becomes very difficult to, um, to really talk truth to power. And there, because there are a set of support networks and systems that really need to be in place so that young people feel safe to be able to enact the change that we, we so want to. Um, so I'd love to hear your experience. Um, so over to you, Sophia. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you to the Deputy Secretary General and also the Youth Envoy and all the activists here and those who are listening. This is such an important space and I would say an important space to talk about how as we youth and also the UN and the entire international community can get together and start thinking about it more broad and intersectional and also intergeneral, intergeneral uh, I would say, solutions. I mean, we're talking about human rights uh, crisis. We're talking about a climate crisis. We are talking about that we are facing different crises and problematics that we cannot then and forget. We're talking about how we are right now facing a pandemic that is also super interlinked with our balance and what, and what we're doing with nature. And this is why I want to talk specifically about my region, Latin America, and also Costa Rica, of course. So I would say that Latin America, as we all know, is one of the most unequal regions in terms of political conflicts, economic conflicts, and also climate crisis. It's one of the most um, vulnerable regions in terms of climate crisis. We are talking about deforestation, we are talking about um, fires, and maze uh, hurricanes. And also we're talking about that even that we are also facing, you know, the climate crisis right now as a different, and I would say different countries and regions, we are also the most vulnerable and most dangerous region to be an environmental defender. Now myself, I, I see myself as an activist, as an advocate. I am from a country which of course is super dangerous to be an environmental defender and in part of the indigenous, indigenous community, but I'm from the city. I have the privilege of being heard and not being, you know, at risk to do so. So I just wanted to talk about that at the beginning. I would say that in terms of adaptation, as my other peer said, it's very crucial to start thinking about community-based climate finance. As also, the Deputy Secretary General said, when we're talking about climate finance and adaptation, we need to think about their specific uh, vulnerable, uh, I would say, uh, I would say uh, what their specific topics that they need, that we need to tackle right now. We, are, we cannot think about adaptation as with a specific place, I would say Costa Rica, and then go to, I would say, Africa and do the same. And that also happens with Europe. And I would say even in the same country, you can talk about the same way to adapt and mitigate as uh, to have more resilient communities. That depends on their social, economical background and how and how the, I would say, the country and the government and the international community is willing to help them and is already helping them. Well, um, as my country, I would say that in Costa Rica, we are known for being this green country human rights leader. And yes, we are. We are doing, we have, for example, this mechanism of offset and kind of green taxes since about like 20 years ago. But, but right now in our Congress, we have some deals. As for example, um, yesterday, the Congress was open to, I would say, reopen trolling again, and how we're going to mit mitigate and adapt to have more resilient communities, coastal communities, if we're talking about a way of reactivate economy that is not sustainable, that is not going to, you know, um, make a big change and transform not only economy, but the way as how we think. And for that, I am also including that we are talking about that in a few months we are going and we are heading to COP26. And 
when we talk about opportunities, we're talking about these big major, uh, we'll say, set, uh, milestone in terms of, is not the, I would say it's not this, the whole solution of the climate crisis, but it gives us like this mechanism and this tool to know how to tackle that, how to look forward, how the government, how the societies need to look forward and rethink and reimagine a better future. But how we can do that if we're not, and the governments are not including as they should um, TV society. I mean, I've already said, I come from, a, I would say with a privileged family and I'm not going to cop because uh, I mean, budgets are short, finance is short. And so can you can you listen to me? Yeah, uh, next, sorry, I, I think that my, my <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, we're talking about that right now, when we talk about climate finance, and not only to finance, like those mechanisms of adapta adaptation, where also need, we need also to finance people to go to those spaces. We need to give badges, we need to, Part uh, you know, to put a bullet and always include civil society at its best. And right now, if I can go to COP, I can only imagine how indigenous communities from my own country, people from coastal areas, they are not being heard. And, and that doesn't include only the international community. I'm also talking about how here in my country, in different Latin American countries, it is so difficult presidents with our Congress people and how we're going to have more resilient communities. Uh, we're going to adaptate, adaptate in terms of human rights, put those human rights at the center of every single conversation if we are not um, promoting to, you know, and listening to those communities that are at the front lines. We're talking about youth, indigenous, women, LGBTQ communities, and, if people, we are not actually including them as we should and, and as we must. And this is a common and shared responsibility us as, as people and activists that we are here, that we are able to talk with you guys and be listened and be heard. And also the government, the international community and private sector, as my old friend already said, private sector has a huge responsibility as well. And we tend to forget that. But Latin America, is facing right now climate migration, as also as the island, the Pacific Island nations, Africa, and different regions. Only for Central America, we are heading to have 5 million climate migrants in terms of two decades. And this is because um, food insecurity, water insecurity, we're talking about the places are not longer to be a place that is good to live. And we are, yeah, just, I wanted to conclude with this that just two points. As the international community and people here promote to ratify this agreement in the Latin American region, this is the huge awesome milestone for secure access to justice, participation, political participation, and public information so everyone knows how their rights and how to protect them and to start thinking with a more common and community-based solutions in terms of what is good to my country, maybe it's not for, for different countries, and this is the only way. And of course, including always youth at the center of every single making process, decisions. Thank you so much, Sophia, I think. Um, and then really thank you for sharing a, a lot of your, your story and uh, really understanding the, con the context that you come from. Um, we get told all the time, stand up and, and, and talk truth to power, but it's very difficult when the system doesn't allow you. Um, so I, I can sympathize with you. Um, I'll, I'd like to hand over now to Archana. Um, and, and Archana, I'm, I'm really sorry to do this, but we, we are running a little bit short on time. So I'm gonna give you only a couple of minutes to, to really uh, share your points. But if you could talk to us about um, what it's like to, to work with an indigenous community specifically around adaptation and resilience. 
Uh, Johar, everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, uh, Your Excellency and my dear friends. Uh, so talking about adaptation and resilience in terms of indigenous and local communities, I would like to emphasize that for us indigenous communities, our traditional knowledge and practices is one of the crucial ways in terms of climate adaptation and resilience. But unfortunately, because of imposition of developmental worldview and extractive developmental projects, our traditional knowledge and practices are at stake and we are seeing a decline or uh, a lack of transition from the elder generation to younger generation. And when we talk about climate adaptation and resilience, the first and the foremost priority needs to promote, support, and document the traditional knowledge and practices of the indigenous and local communities. And these traditional knowledge and practices of the indigenous communities also needs to be embedded in the national and the global policy making processes. And when I talk about uh, adaptation and resilience, the first and the foremost thing which again comes down is about right recognition of the indigenous and local communities because until and unless the land rights of the indigenous and local communities, the forest rights are recognized, it is very, very difficult for the indigenous communities to contribute towards climate adaptation and resilience as they have been doing so because for us, our land and forest is a source of identity along with the livelihood and it is a spiritually connected and we see land and forest as our ancestors and if we don't have our ancestors blessings it is very very difficult to continue the adaptation and resilience mechanism which we have been doing and the challenges which we have been facing is one of the contradictory policies which are being there uh, both in the national level and the global level and the contradictory between the global policies and the national policies the national policies and the local policies so i think it is very important for us to push forward for an uh, intersection of this policy makings, like for example, whether it is sustainable development goals, whether it is livelihood, whether it is health issues, I think it needs to come together as an intersection wherein we are all working towards climate adaptation and resilience because we cannot achieve climate adaptation if we are not working in terms of disaster management, if we are not working on terms of uh, agriculture management uh, and agriculture planning. So it is very important for us to work in an integrated approach, uh, ensuring that the indigenous people are uh, integral to this uh, policies and also I would like to highlight that when we are talking about climate finance, often uh, indigenous people's perspective has been left out uh, is what I feel because for us again you know our land and our forest are not commodities uh, and it's not a commercial entity for sale so when we are talking about climate finance it is also very important to support uh, the indigenous practices and knowledge and tradition in a way which is not commercializing the land and forest but it is in a way where we are working together to ensure a sustainable practice of the forest and land. And the third thing which I would like to also emphasize that, yes, we all have been working and emphasizing on nature-based solution. And it is very crucial, which we are also seeing that uh, it's one of the crucial thing for COP26, which is coming in. But I would also like to say that uh, nature-based solution needs to prioritize uh, the indigenous communities needs to prioritize the traditional knowledge and practices and the right recognition because uh, nature-based solution cannot be seen as an alternative to cut emission. Nature-based solution along with emission reduction is very, very integral for climate adaptation and resilience. And we have also been seeing immense uh, reports and evidence where nature-based solution has also been one of the ways of greenwashing and is also one of the ways of uh, promoting artificial plantation and also monoculture plantation. So it is very important also to see the evidence and the grassroots realities, what it has been happening and to emphasize for a uh, community-based and indigenous people, uh, uh, integral making indigenous people uh, an integral part for the uh, nature-based solution implementation also. And the last thing which I would like to emphasize is that it's very unfortunate, but still now most of the countries have not incorporated rights recognition of indigenous people, uh, meaningful leadership of indigenous people in their NDCs uh, in terms of the adaptation and resilience. And I think it is very, very crucial for all of us to push forward the countries 
to ensure that it is incorporated in the NDCs because no matter we make uh, whatever national policies or global policies, if it is not incorporated in the NDCs, it is very difficult for us young people also to push forward it and advocate it. So my uh, Lastly, I would like to call upon uh, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary General to ensure that there is more and more participation of uh, indigenous young youth and youth uh, all together in the spaces like as young researchers from the indigenous communities and as a policy makers, junior negotiators in the UNFCCC processes also. And I think it is very important for us to make a conscious effort to ensure that there is meaningful participation because we cannot expect the indigenous people to participate if there is no enabling spaces for them and if they're still continuing to face the gross human rights violation. So yes, uh, COVID-19 recovery has also taught us that it can be done together, climate action and COVID-19 recovery. And I think it's very important for us to work towards just transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Archana. Um, and DSG, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a question that often young people get asked and it's, if you could please do the elevator pitch version of, of your response to, uh, to, to these two wonderful, wonderful young ladies. Absolutely, thank you very much. And this has been very useful for me. It informs a lot of the decision-making that we use to try to stand up a lot of the things that you're saying at the country level. UN's footprint in the country is huge. We're not doing enough. Um, to do the convening that we sh should do of the different stakeholders, um, especially when we can put strange bedfellows in the same room. We can put government, we can put parliamentarians, we can put indigenous people, um, and we need to think more creatively on how to do that. Um, and so to, you know, three very big messages, intergenerational justice um, is absolutely at the core of the efforts that we do. Um, and so much of what we see is, as again, assets for profit really need to be assets seen for people and the planet and how we can you know, manage them. Uh, and, and everyone gets a, a, a fair share of it in terms of its sustainability, um, because that's what matters to us most, the protection. I think it's um, for us, one of the biggest challenges we have, the outrage um, for uh, those who uh, speak for rights, who advocate for rights. So our environmental defenders and the way and manner in which we see them in indigenous contexts um, being trampled on in many cases, losing their lives, this is something that needs to stop. This is something that we need to say to our people. You know, they say that uh, even amongst thieves, there is honor. When you go to war, there's a code of conduct. Um, I mean, everyone who is fighting for their rights should not have to lose their lives in doing so. Voices are important um, and everyone needs to respect that. So I think, you know, again, targeting um, our media needs to be, uh, we need to find a way to collaborate with media um, that does the follow on that follows not just the incident and the loss of light, life and the outrage, but follows the perpet perpetrators um, and tries to help us with the media and voice hold accountable. I also think that we need to be speaking to parliaments um, in, in democracies, whatever the type of democracy, if it's a work in progress or it's struggling, whatever the type of democracy, representatives are there. And we need to take those issues to those parliaments and to those representatives and really push it is a journey. It's just not something that happens overnight, but we have to keep plugging away and never give up on, on, on trying to achieve them. And then of course, recognizing the rights and roles of indigenous people. We must learn better to co-create on the investments into these pipelines with indigenous people. We cannot do this at the informal level without participation. It's not a sterile consultation we want. We are saying that now in the UN and we're trying to change. So keep pushing us. Um, uh, to get the most at the country level, make the demands. The UN belongs to you. It's not just a government institution, it's a government institution for people. So it belongs to you and you, you need to grab that um, and, and, uh, and challenge, this, uh, challenge us on that um, so that these investments that we make in livelihoods, um, the dividend will be in peace, in green, in thriving, in, in equality. Uh, those are the kind of things we need to say is that you invest in this, this is the dividend and make that dividend um, you know, uh, stick as, as, as we get so. So uh, last and, and not least, I mean, I think it's, it is young people that are going to make this happen. Uh, you talked about capacity building. Um, as we go forward, uh, it's a new world and a new workplace. COVID has shown us how we are really on the move to a new environment where digital technology, if we're left behind, it's going to be even worse than we have ever imagined. 
but young people are leading all sorts of um, initiatives and as I as I see lately um, digital nomads are the new informal because they are everywhere and anywhere um, they will change the way earning happens the workspace happens um, the, the 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 life balance between what you would like to see with your family your friends and and what you need to do to earn so this is an interesting piece here and and, and the more you bring that to the fore that governments then need to take notice because they that's something that's not controllable. The new way of working, the new way of engaging, your connectivity um, is a new era. Um, uh, we hope that we can be part of that in the intergenerational transition, but this has been a fantastic discussion. I, I, I wish that we had so much more uh, time. I forgot to say earlier, uh, Millicent, I, I've never seen a country like the Solomon Islands with so much diversity. I, I've never been privileged to visit, um, but my parents lived there and my sisters visited and you know diversity half of them were thought to be from the solomon islands so my sisters often say that you know we're not only from nigeria we're also from the solomon islands so let's just remember we are one family we're rich in our diversity let's not allow people to take that and be a distraction and weaken what is human about us that can achieve uh, the climate agenda and much more thank you so much amina and i understand that you might need to you might need to take your leave from this conversation, but I would like to extend the Vinakabakalev, Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I wish you, wish you well in the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, the honor was all mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So we will now have the pleasure of hearing from, uh, from Nathan, um, who will give us a little bit of a rundown on some of the activities that um, the, the Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change has been up to over the last um, year and a bit. Um, and, and I think it's been, it's definitely been a, a strange year and a bit for the Youth Advisory Group, given the, the, the virtual nature of a lot of the things that we took part in, um, and, and the fact that I think we've only ever really met vis-a-vis um, -a, -vis a, a screen. Um, but also I think Nathan, I'd love to hear some more about intersectionality and, and the way that we can tie some of the fantastic ideas and conversation that we've had with climate financing and adaptation and resilience um, through, the, through the intersectional lens. So over to you, Nathan. Hi, Ernest. Hi, everyone. It's, it's really great to be here and hopefully we'll get to meet soon in person in Milan. Uh, and that will probably be the most important thing of the meeting, being able to hug each other and be together. Um, very quickly to say again that the UNSG has appointed us seven activists from different continents, different countries, different communities, and, and from different backgrounds as well, to advise him and the UN in their work to drive uh, the climate agenda. In the very first meeting, and I will never forget that, the UNSG and the DSG, Amina Mohammed, had told us not only to look at climate issues, but also at the green recovery and uh, social issues in general. And that's something we've done in the past years, always looking at how the climate action needs to be rooted um, in human rights, uh, putting our fingers as we're on worrying element of climate finance. And of course, the 100 billion commitment that is still uh, not fulfilled from the pa Paris Agreement. And also sometimes calling states and key philanthropic organizations to fund youth movement. And a lot has been said today about this, but it's so important to ensure that we have the means to fight for climate um, justice future. Um, and, on, and of course, generally speaking, we've tried to ensure always that the UN and the states do engage in meaningful dialogues um, and not you know, tick the boxes exercise with, with young people all over the world. We'll be heading soon to Milan, as it has been mentioned before, to co-chair um, the youth pre-cup. That will be a very important uh, event for you know, working on the climate agenda, but also looking at all the different sectors, food, fashion, art, and many more to think about how we can build a fairer future. And as we can see, and as you can see, we followed the advice of, of Mrs. Uh, Mohammed of looking at this um, issue while also uh, trying to gain understanding on what we have to do and what states have to do on climate finance, climate adaptation, climate mitigation as well. Yet it's very important, and we're realizing it more and more every day, that the climate crisis is also rooted in a social 
crisis. And is it not time now to acknowledge that what is at the cause of discrimination and injustices to local and indigenous folks, to LGBTQI plus group, to BIPOC minorities as well, is often what is leading us to the climate crisis, patriarchy, lack of empathy, the power of money, the power of self-interest. And it's really essential that we look at these systemic issues to address not only the climate crisis, but also all the different crises we're facing today and will be facing more and more in the future. And you can be sure that for the next year to come of our mandate, the Youth Advisory Group of the UNSG, um, and first of all, the seven <laughs> activists um, that we are, will keep focusing on that. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Thank you so much for that rundown. I think it's been, it's definitely been a busy year and, and I think you did well to condense that into a couple of minutes. So thanks very much, Nathan. Um, before we close off for today, I, I really just wanna reiterate a point that we made at the beginning of this session, that this conversation is something that started long before this, this live link went live um, and it'll be one that will continue um, much longer into the future. Uh, when we're talking about the climate crisis, when we're talking about a just recovery, um, it's not a conversation that's ever going to take place within an hour. It's something that we need to continually contribute to from every level. Um, and if there's one thing that I'd like to reiterate from Amina Mohammed's um, conversation with us today, it's really that it's so much more than an ecological and environmental crisis that we're dealing with at the moment. It's really uh, an intersectional, multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral problem that we have to deal with. And the only way that we can do that is if we put our hands and heads together um, and really try and affect change um, in, in a multi-pronged way. Um, so at this time, I would like to, to hand over to, 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 to Jayatma um, to see if she has anything that she would like to add before we close off this session. No, not really. Thank you very much, Ernest, and also to our wonderful speakers. I want to apologize that we didn't have enough time to take the questions from the audience, but uh, I think that uh, all of our speakers did such a wonderful job in communicating uh, many of the key messages that also came to us in the uh, preparatory process of this meeting through social media and the youth network. So thank you so much once again. And Ernest said uh, this is just one milestone of a, of a very long uh, and uh, carefully strategized process, I should say, from the Youth Advisory Group um, of Climate Change of the Secretary General. So I, I really look forward to supporting all of your work uh, going forward. Thank you very much once again. Thank you so much, Jayatma. And, and a kind reminder to everybody that although we didn't get through some of the Q&A session, we can still continue to ask questions on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook and continue to use our voices as loud and as much as possible. So a big and signing off from here in Fiji. Thank you, everybody.